have to be willing to continually reinvent yourself because it's Mm -hmm. a constant growth and learning and changing and shifting as the trends shift. And so you've got to be willing to constantly reinvent yourself. Hello and welcome. This is Freelancing 101, Episode 3. The title of this is How to Sell Your Voice, though I think that's a little possibly weird. And as I talk with my guest, Alicia, maybe I'll I'll update that. But I'm your host, Connor Welch. I'm a full-time meta and Google ad freelancer. So I essentially help companies advertise on Facebook, Instagram, Google, YouTube, TikTok, and more. As I mentioned before, I am joined with Alicia Baig. She is a voice actress that is also full-time freelancing. Alicia, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to chat. Did I do your title, voice actress? It's funny. Almost no one says voice actress, but my husband always laughs. He's like, why don't you say voice actress? I'm like, because the... The SEO doesn't match up with that word. Like nobody searches for voice actress. It's voice actor. I probably more oh. identify with the term voice over actor because yes. most of my work is commercial and corporate and uh, less people. I tell people I'm a voice actor and they immediately go, oh, what have I seen you? What have I heard your voice in? And I'm like, not that kind of voice actor. Like I'm not going to be in a cartoon that you've seen, I promise, uh, mm. yet. And that's not off the table completely, but it's not where I, it's not my bread and butter. Let's put it like that. So yeah, voice, voiceover actor, voice actor, voiceover, whatever. (laughs) That's good. So this episode, we're going to dive into the what, why, and how uh, someone can sell their voiceover services. So there, that kind of matches. Perfect. And before we dive into the what, why, and how, I like to just start with this introductory question. If you could give one piece of advice to an aspiring freelancer, and maybe even specifically a voiceover actor or actress, what would that piece of advice be? Oh, this is a great question. Um, And I would say that you have to be willing to continually reinvent yourself because it's Mm -hmm. a constant growth and learning and changing and shifting as the trends shift. And so you've got to be willing to constantly reinvent yourself. Which is kind of fun, though. That's why I'm sure you're so excited with what you do, or at least I am. Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, I'm I have a super fun job, of course, but yeah, I love it. Another way to possibly word that is I guess this is maybe a little bit more negative, but being okay to fail and learn from it. Is that a good way to put that? Like, that's what I've unfortunately experienced is, you know, a lot of times uh, maybe I don't get that client or I'm, uh, pitch my service is weird and I fail, but I learn from it and I get better and better. Is that yeah. A hundred percent. Should we go more positive? <laughs> no, it's, uh, actually, I would say in my industry that that is even more than any other industry that the mm-hmm. reality. And it's because we audition, I put in hundreds of auditions a week, some weeks, yeah. and I might book one or two of those. So if you look at the, I mean, if people look at that as I failed a hundred times to get one success, but um, we don't look at it as failing. If you do, then you'll get just depressed really fast. But um, you have to have a lot of no's before you get a yes. And even more in this Mm. business than any other. So interesting. Well, perfect intro question. And also leads into the what section. And the first question is, what do you do? That, kind of that is a really great question. Um, it's something I didn't actually know. Uh, so when I first decided to use my voice to make money, I loved audiobooks and I wanted to make audiobooks. Um, and so I I did. I made an audiobook. I, I got the first one I auditioned for in my closet with my cell phone. I had no idea what I was doing and um, quickly realized audiobooks are not for me for a variety of reasons. Um, I do one occasionally, but they're not they're a marathon and I'm a sprinter, uh, Mm -hmm. largely because of ADHD, um, which is probably why you hear me skip all over the place. But so I Googled how to make money with your microphone one day because I had invested money in buying a microphone and, and learning how to use it and spending the months. It actually took me a few months to make that first audiobook because I didn't know what I was doing and voiceover popped up and a voiceover or a voice actor can be a lot of different things. Um, but Mainly, it's that voice that you hear on a commercial. If you watch TV, 
it, you think you you think the actors are the voice that you're hearing, but they're almost never the voice that you're hearing. When you start being aware of it, you'll realize most commercials on TV, the people in the commercials never open their mouth. Um, mm-hmm. It's a voiceover. It's someone sitting in a booth like me who records the voice for the actors who are on screen. And um, it's also like that voice that tells you to please take your receipt at the grocery store when you're checking out at the little machine or it's radio ads or it's welcome to your benefits for 2024. You know, those Mm -hmm. videos that you get at work or e-learnings and trainings. Um, Here's explainer videos is a a large portion of what I do. And that's like uh, here's this software that we've got like business to business marketing. Mm -hmm. We'll have a video and it's like here's our software. Here's why you'll love it. This is the pain point that it's going to solve for you. And here's how you can get in touch with us, right? Like a basic explainer format. I do a lot of those. Um, So that's a voiceover. Most people think of voice actor and they think, you know, anime and um, animation video games, but I don't, I don't do that part as much. Um, Mainly because I committed to myself early in my career that I would not put my voice on anything that I didn't want my kids to overhear or that I didn't want representing me as a person. And so uh, that kind of X's out a lot of video games and um, mm-hmm. it X's out a lot of a lot of uh, animation, not kids animation, but you have to live in LA really to make it in that. And I'm not, that's not happening. So. Oh, I love that. So I asked you, what do you do? But that whole time, it literally sounded like I was listening to like a really cl- crystal clear radio host. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, that's exactly what she does. Yep. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. I'm the you voice. You have to explain it. <laughs> when you call on the phone and they say, please press one, that, yes, that's that same. Lots of different ways you can use a voice. Oh, fantastic. So you, real quick, how long have you done this? So I've been doing it for five years, pretty much exactly. This time of year was when I auditioned for that first audiobook. It was 2018. Fantastic. So what skills did you find out quickly that you needed, both maybe hard and soft skills? <laughs> so it's it's funny. I, I think a lot of people misunderstand um, and think that they're going to be able to just walk into a recording studio somewhere and just do the art part of the job, mm-hmm. um, the performance aspect. And that's what I thought. Um, but you actually have to record, edit, and produce your own audio most of the time. So mm. right off the bat, I needed to know how to use audio software or a digital audio workstation or a DAW. Um, and I needed to know how to edit audio, which I had no idea. I'd never heard the term EQ or equalization. I mean, I'd heard it. I was in theater, so I'd heard it, but I didn't know what it meant. Mm. So the learning curve on that is pretty steep. Um, there are people you can pay to teach you that do a great job, uh, but it is you still really need to understand the basics. So that was kind of the, I guess that's a hard skill, maybe engineering, mm-hmm. kind of basic yeah. audio engineering. And then um, really quickly, I learned that no one's going to hand me work. Nobody's going to be like, oh, here's this job for you. Uh, mm-hmm. You have to go out and get it. So not only did I have I have to learn how to edit and produce audio. I also had to learn how to find the work, which was really hard. Um, I thought I thought that it was going to be a lot easier than it was. Uh, There's a lot of marketing involved. I had to learn to build a website. Um, I guess theoretically I could have paid someone, but I was trying to do this to supplement our family's income, not to drain it. So Mm -hmm. I was trying to do I did everything myself at the beginning. So I, I built my own website. I learned how to navigate social media. I learned how to create content. I. I learned how to do my own invoicing and billing, and I learned how to do uh, marketing. I think I already said that, but that was a big one. Um, And I learned how to work with clients and be professional and make sure that, you know, you, I, like I said, I came from being a stay at home mom for 15 years before I did this. Mm -hmm. So 15 years of managing children didn't necessarily navigate the waters of the corporate world as well. So I had to learn a lot of that, like, you know, not sending emails at nine o'clock at night when I'm thinking about it, because that's not someone's working hours, you know? Mm. So there was a lot of, a lot of stuff to learn. Steep learning curve for sure. This, everything you just said, especially the marketing, marketing yourself, I found, and I'm sure this is accurate, that it's universal for any freelancer, right? So it's yes. like 
you you get this really valuable skill that you're like I know has a lot of value but it's like how do I show people or even just show up to people that need this service and already know that there's value and a lot of times people don't know what like the actual real value so then you have to explain the value and the marketing side of freelancing is for me was a really big hurdle ironically I that's what I do for a skill but to market my own personal brand was really difficult but very universal and i think that's the high risk high reward of freelancing nobody's just gonna bring you work you've got to go find it nobody's gonna do it for you that's for sure and i i think there's the ick factor of marketing that i struggled with like I didn't even like selling fruit door to door for chorus when I was in high school, right? Like I didn't, I never wanted to be a salesperson and to suddenly be selling me and my services, my package, like what I have to offer, just, it felt at first, like, like I was selling me. That sounds terrible, but you get what I'm saying, right? And um, someone told me early on, and it really helped that um, that I was selling the service I had to offer that people need. So I was offering Mm -hmm. them this, this thing that they actually need. And it's been really fun to work with people who are like, I'm so glad that you reached out because you did such a great job and we needed that. But we were just gonna, you know, use Jane in accounting and her microphone is her laptop and it wasn't going to be great, you know? And so they're able to get a better, more professional sound to deliver their message better. But yeah, it's, it's hard. And I feel like I'm still, it's still, it's still a struggle. Like I think I've had three people send me a cold message in LinkedIn in the last week, like buy my wealth management plan or, you know, let me, let's get on a call so I can tell you how to spend your money better? Or do you need a financial advisor? I'm like, I no, I don't need any of those things. But I try to be nice because they don't know I don't need them. And maybe I do. So how do you know who to market to? And how do you know whether you're being spammy or whether you're offering a service they need is a little harder for a voice actor because any, almost anybody could need a voice actor at any point, whether it's for their phone Mm -hmm. system, or maybe they're making a video for their business, or they're going to put something out on the radio locally and you just, you just don't know who that person's going to be. So, yeah. You've spoken on what skills you need, but was there any uh, official training or training you'd recommend for somebody that's kind of getting started, maybe courses, online things, or is it really just kind of not trial and error, but start and get better? (laughs) There, there are a hundred percent things I recommend. I'm going to start with the things I don't recommend because mm-hmm. there are some snake oil salesmen out there who are selling this idea like make money in your PJs with your iPhone. That stuff's all a scam. That's not real. It, it is. There is no one making money in their PJs with their iPhone. Um, and there are sites and companies that will sell you a package like, oh, if you pay this $6,000, I'm not even exaggerating, $6,000, mm-hmm. then we'll um, we'll do give you all the training and then you'll make a demo. And a demo is like your examples of your voice that you put out to the world so they can hear you and know um, what they're purchasing, right? It's a, it's a necessary gateway to to doing good work is that you need a professional demo. And um, so these companies will sell you a package where you can take all this training and get a demo at the end. I do not recommend that. I do recommend um, uh, learning as much as you can before you jump into the water. And uh, there's a site called Gravy for the Brain. It's like $40 a month and you get access to literally hundreds of webinars and you can sign up for a mentor and you can do their... um, They have script libraries and videos to take you through it. So it's a great kind of all-in-one resource to kind of help people figure out what is this? What do I need to do? How do I market myself? Like, what is a good performance? What are the different genres? Like, literally, I could talk just getting into voiceover for five hours and we wouldn't cover everything. I will say I have a podcast um, that with two other voice actors. It's called VO Booth Besties. And we have a 101 series. There's like... 20, 10, 20 episodes, something like that. I don't, I can't remember how many episodes there are in the 101 series, but it takes you through the steps um, and it's all free. Uh, And we're always, we have a Facebook community and the three of us are always willing to offer 
a little advice on the side. None of us coach. None of us get paid to do it. We all just do it because we love the community. Um, but let's see, what else? You you definitely need some coaching at the beginning because there are some very specific things about the way people read out loud um, that make them sound like they're reading out loud. And what sells in our current market is sounding natural and authentic. Nobody wants to be sold to right now. They they just want us to have a conversation with them where they learn about a product or a service and they don't feel like you're shoving it down their throat. But a lot of people, when they begin reading, it's da 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 And it, it, it's something you have to learn to break yourself out of, which is weird that before you even start, you know you're going to probably do it wrong. <laughs> but You say that, and I just did the intro, and I'm like, I definitely just did that. So <laughs> I've got to learn how to do that as well. But you're right. It's just like it's not as simple as just reading off a prompt or a script or something. Um, you mentioned a professional demo. What would be a good route of getting a demo recorded and releasing it and making it accessible on a budget? So the path that I recommend for um, the more budget conscious is that you begin with samples. A lot of the... Mm -hmm. Um, and we haven't even talked about how you get work other than direct marketing, which is great. Direct marketing is great, but um, there a lot of the there's platforms online where you can sign up. You pay a yearly fee. We call them pay to plays, and you can put your voice samples up, and then you'll match to projects, and then you audition. So that's kind of the basic way that a lot of the work is done. Um, so you need samples for that. So I always recommend people start with getting just a bunch of samples up. They can list those on their website in playlists. So they could have like medical samples and they could three or four medical samples, um, technical samples, uh, e-learning samples, children's narration, audiobooks, whatever. And you can source content for that anywhere on the internet. Just pick a paragraph and read it out loud and practice that way. Um, so that's a good way to get samples fairly inexpensively. And then learn what you're good at, learn what you're not good at. I've learned that there are things that just aren't my lane and I kind of stay out of them. And uh, and that's when you'll know you're, like, you're ready to make a demo is when you feel you're booking work consistently and you're feeling confident, then you might progress to a demo. I, I have some feelings about whether demos are becoming as important as they used to be because mm -hmm. so many sites are leaning towards more of a sample-based thing. But if you want to work with an agent, which is the best way to get work, because you know how I said nobody's going to give you work, <laughs> they're mm -hmm. the one person that's going to give you work. So um, I have agents in New York and L.A., and they send me auditions. And most of the time I audition, I'm in a pool of other talent and um, a casting director reviews the auditions and then they send their top five or 10 or 20 to the, to the client, the client chooses, and then we book work. But every now and then they call me up and they're like, hey, we've got a job. They just booked you off of your demo. They love, they love your voice and I just get to do the job. So those are always my favorite because I didn't have to do anything for that. Um, but you do need the demo for that. You know, just to, to even be listened to by an agent, you need a demo. But I will say post 2020 two ish it's pretty much impossible to sign with an agent these days like unless you know somebody or you fit a really unique demographic that they're not currently overbooked like have a ton of people in that same demographic it's pretty hard to get an agent so most voice talent are going to book the bulk of their work through direct marketing and pay to play sites online interesting which would be more of the sample basis yep yep which is why i'm like i don't know about the but now Professional demo producers will give you your demo is typically like a minute to a minute and 15 seconds, and it will have five to six-ish samples in it, and they'll mix it with music and make them blend and kind of flow together. They'll also give you those individual pieces that you can upload as samples, so they'll give you like that 15-second clip, so you, don't, so you don't just have this montage of... Um, because a good demo represents different aspects of your voice. So you'd you'd first be maybe like bubbly and conversational, and then you'd have like a luxury read, you know, and then you'd do like um, a medical narration where you're getting very technical and you're over enunciating and you're being very precise. And then mm -hmm. you might have something a little bit more 
like the mom read. Oh my gosh, my kids are driving me crazy. I don't know, something along those lines. So there, there's some variation. Um, and that's super important to showcase that variation. So that's why a good demo producer will know all of that. Really shady demo producers don't. And I have people send me their demos all the time. And I'm like, every single spot sounds identical. So you just paid for five spots, but they're not going to book you work, you know? So, yes. Uh, recommend, let's see. Um, I recommend Jordan. Oh, I just forgot his name. <laughs> He's going to hate me. I can't believe it. There's good demo producers out there. I'll send you a list and you can okay. include it in your notes. But it. Or just, just reach out to me and I'll, I'm happy to, to give anybody a recommendation. But um, usually by the time you're ready to make a demo, you know who the good demo producers are. For sure. I'll link the list and a way to contact you and your podcast and website. Just That'd be great. We're going to make it so all the listeners, because this is so valuable, and I, I didn't realize the barrier to entry, if you want to call it that, was uh, in my mind rather significant. That, that's quite a bit. To just, well, yeah, uh, and we, we haven't even talked about the equipment you have to purchase, I right? Like, that's the next question. <clears throat> there's a, there is a barrier to entry. Now, there, there are different schools of thought. There are people who will disagree with me, and that is totally fine, right? Like, everybody in freelancing is going to find their own path, and it's not going to look the same for everybody. I talked to a guy um, who's an amazing voice actor, and he exclusively books off of a website that I refuse to use. Um, because I don't like their ethics and kind of how they treat the industry. And so I don't use that site. Um, he thinks I'm ridiculous for not using the site. I think he's ridiculous for using it, right? But he does really, really well on that site. He's not going to sign with a national agent because they're not going to look at somebody who's on that site, right? But it's a give and take. He's making more money than I am. So who am I to say that he's wrong and I'm right? You know, like... Freelancers have to find their own path, and anybody who tells you that the way you're doing it is wrong is wrong. So, <laughs> or or they're just coming up from their path, right? Like they got it to work this way, but you know they climbed the mountain using a different path, and that's exactly kind of what's so exciting about freelancing, right? Okay, the next question. This is the final what, because I really want to dive into the how, especially the marketing side. But what are like what are some reasonable cost for the equipment? What's required and what's maybe recommended? That's a great question. So there are some basic things that you need to cover. One is that you need a place that's pretty free of external noise coming in. So soundproofed to some degree. We're not going to truly soundproof, but um, clearly I have invested a lot of money uh, in the Studio Bricks booth, which I love. Mm -hmm. I It was a huge need for me because like I said, my neighbor was mowing his lawn multiple days a week and I was having to cancel sessions with clients that were in the thousands of dollars. And so mm -hmm. that was, it was a necessity for me, but most people starting out can get by with, um, you can make DIY acoustic panels. Well, that's mm -hmm. sound treatment. Sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. Have a space to record that's quiet away from the noises outside. You can hang moving blankets and things on the wall to kind of isolate the noise. People will make a blanket fort. You can Google PVC blanket fort, and that will help you get an idea of some some little things that you can do really inexpensively. Then um, you need to think about sound treatment. So there's keeping the sound out, and then there's what we do with the sound inside of our booth. So when you speak, your sound waves move forward, and they hit hard surfaces, and they bounce, and then they come back, and they cancel each other out, and you lose kind of the mid-range of your voice. So you sound kind of echoey or weird or a little more old timey. So you want as much stuff to uh, absorb that extra sound as possible. So a walk-in closet is a really great place to record because it has walls lined with fabric and with clothes and things, right? In, an, in a pinch, you can literally staple pillows to the wall or put them, stack them behind your microphone to help with that sound. So these are just things that you can do really cheaply. Now, when it comes to equipment, because I'm always going to talk about space before equipment, because if you took my microphone that is a $1,300 microphone with all of this stuff, it's going to sound terrible in a space that hasn't been treated. And you could take a $100 Bluetooth cheap microphone and it would sound great in a well-treated space. So it doesn't matter what kind of mic you have if your space isn't ready to accommodate it. 
So um, a good basic starter microphone that I recommend is the Rode NT1 microphone, not the NT1A. That's important. The Rode NT1 fifth generation microphone is set up so that you can use it USB, which is huge because typically I wouldn't have recommended USB microphones, but um, they do a really good job with the Rode NT1. Then you can also use it XLR. The difference is XLR has to go into an interface. An interface is a little box that takes the analog signal from your microphone and turns it into ones and zeros that your computer can understand and register as an audio file. So you need an, you need something to do that. A USB microphone does it with like this tiny little bit of equipment, right? Whereas an interface is like a box with lots of stuff in it. So it does a better job typically, but the Rode NT1 does a pretty good job just with the basic USB interface. But you can grow into having um, an XLR, which is like the three prongs cable, like a mic cable is an XLR cable. Um, you can kind of grow into that when you're ready to invest in an interface then you can kind of move up to that. And then, um, you know, a good computer that has a fast processor because digital audio workstations use a lot of um, computer memory. And so I have a MacBook Pro. I love it. A lot of people use Windows computers and they work great. I mean, it's not, I'm not going to get into the MacBook or Windows debate, but I love my MacBook. So, um, so that, yeah, as well. <laughs> good, com yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan. Guy. Good computer, decent microphone. You do not need to go spend a ton of money um, right on the offset, on the outset of your career. Um, mm -hmm. I've owned like, we're not going to talk about how many microphones I've owned. I've owned a lot of microphones. Sometimes you have to kind of go through them to, before you find one that's a good fit for your voice. Most of the industry mm -hmm. loves the TLM 103 microphone. It sounded terrible on my voice. Uh, so I went with the Sennheiser MKH 416, which is like a boom mic that they use in movie sets, but it's really great at blocking out all the other noise. So I love it. Um, neighbor mowing lawns thing again. <laughs> so there, uh, there is really quite a bit of stuff you need to do before you really start. The basic nutshell though is you do need a space, you do need a microphone, potentially an interface and a laptop that can handle it. And you need a digital audio workstation to be able to manage that. Audacity is free. So it's a program that you can use. Um, the learning curve, I feel like, is a little bit steeper. Um, I use Adobe Audition, which costs $23 a month-ish. Mm -hmm. So it's not a huge investment of money, but that's Okay. That's kind of, and then coaching. And I do think you need coaching before you really dive in deep. And I did not at the beginning of my career. I was like, the only people telling me to coach are coaches. And they're just trying to take mm -hmm. my money. And I was wrong. In my first coaching session, she taught me everything I had spent nine months learning. So for nine months, I was clawing my way through the industry, trying to learn everything. And in one session, she was like, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, I just spent nine months. Like I could have been working. Mm -hmm. You know, I could have been at that point nine months earlier, if that makes sense. Like, that yes. Called? The I, cost of opportunity. You've, yes. you've almost missed out on the cost of opportunity. Yes. Yeah. So. Well, I, I'm going to link, because there's so much more information than I could have imagined. And now that we're yeah. talking, I'm like, oh, yeah, I see why. But I really want to dive into why you chose maybe the freelance style, if we want to call it that. But just the f maybe free agent or something like that. And I want you to tell me like what pros and cons you found. I don't even know. Are there like in-house voice acting positions or is it almost totally freelance style? So it's, I guess it's all in how you look at it. Um, okay. There are, so if you're a narrator, an audiobook narrator, there are publishing houses that will put you on their roster, but it's not like you're getting a salary. Right. Mm -hmm. I have every now and then I'll see a job come across LinkedIn. Like I have job alerts set up just because sometimes people will post like that, that they need a voice actor for a pro project as a job. Um, mm -hmm. And they'll say that they're going to pay a, a salary for this for a voice actor. But when you get down to it, you realize that that's not what actually what they're paying for. It's just mm -hmm. they want a content marketer or they want um, somebody to do all of the video production and everything. But they're just posting it that way so no I don't 
I don't really know of any salaried positions where you're like working for a corporation. I do know a lot of people who work for corporations and do voiceover on the side for their corporation and they never get paid. <laughs> like they get their normal salary, but they're always like, oh, can you just do this project on the side? And they have no idea that they should be getting compensated separately for that because one thing that's interesting about voiceover is we get paid in two ways. And one is that we get paid for our time. So like a session fee is the amount of time that you spend. And the other is usage. So how many people hear your voice and for how long and in what market determine how much you should be paid. So if I do a radio spot for just North Carolina for just like 13 weeks, it would be X amount of dollars. But if I was to do that same radio spot for all of the United States for 13 weeks, it would be significantly higher because more people hear it. And the reason for that is because then, let's say I did a project uh, for Coke and then Pepsi comes up with an audition. I, I'm not going to really be marketable for Pepsi because I just did a project for Coke and it's still mm. out there with my voice. So it kind of knocks you out of other projects. So that's usage. Um, so f freelance really is, I, I mean, it, it's kind of the only way to function as a voice actor. Um, when you're signed, there are people who do not consider themselves freelancers. They're signed with agencies and they've been with those agencies so long and they have so many clients that they just come back to them for work. So they're not actively marketing and, and they don't know anything about LinkedIn and they don't even really maybe even have a website because all of their work is coming through agents. That is rapidly shifting away. That is older talent who've been in the industry 20 years, 15 years. The newer talent are never going to experience that same phenomenon. Now, you do reach a point, it's a snowball, right, with freelancing. I think any freelancing job is a snowball. Like you're building your snowball really small and you're just, you just keep rolling and you keep putting in energy and it grows and it grows and those clients come back to you for more work. And so your snowball gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But you never know when a rainstorm is going to come along and wash away your snowball and you got to start all over. And so it, that's kind of the nature of freelancing and it is definitely the way it works with voiceover. Two years ago, I had so many clients that I wasn't doing any marketing. I didn't need to. I They just kept coming back. But then I had to stay home and homeschool my kids during the pandemic. And I lost a lot of those clients because I couldn't. I they Honestly, I don't know that any of them were like, oh, we're not going to work with you anymore because you're not available. I'm always available. But I wasn't reaching out and touching base with them and establishing the, you know, keeping that relationship going because I was so busy homeschooling a bunch of kids during the pandemic. So freelancing always has its risks. Like you said, the risk and the, the risk for the opportunity, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was the why. And you also touched on the how, because one of my questions for how is how you make income. I, I'm just interested by this. So you're saying, is it either or you either get paid for the session or based off of the usage, if that's a good word, or is it both? That, that's really interesting to me. So it depends. Um, a resource for anybody who's looking for more information on this is the GVAA rate guide. If you want to just Google GVAA rate guide, you'll find a lot of information more than you ever wanted to know. But when it's corporate, so if it's non-broadcast, you typically just paid for the project. So like a non-broadcast um, explainer video for a business, they might pay you $300. You do the project, you're done. They own the rights to it in perpetuity forever to use mm -hmm. non-broadcast. If they then wanted to turn that into a commercial and broadcast it on the radio or on TV, they would need to pay you usage rights. Um, but when it comes to commercial work, so... I had a job a few weeks ago for a big national company. They paid me $432 precisely for the session. It was a two-hour session, and we, okay. we plugged through all of the spots that I was doing. That might be all I ever make from that, okay? Because if they decide not to use the audio, they still paid me for my time for that session. Mm -hmm. But if they don't, if my voice does not appear is actually the word they use, but Obviously, we're not going to see it. If my voice does not appear in the final product, I won't get paid usage. If it does, I'll make significantly more than that 
initial time thing that I got. Um, so broadcast usage pays you, I mean, broadcast rights pay you usage. Now. And is it residual? Like Yes. Many, so they'll, it'll be for a period of time. So like okay. um, the one, this one I think was one year. So if after one year they want to renew, it's the same amount they paid the year before plus 10%. So it, wow. you get paid for as often as they use it. Um, I did an ad for Starbucks a couple of years ago and they, or I guess it was last year, and they used it for a month. And then I got a check in the mail and I was like, what? And she was like, yeah, they used it for another month because it was only supposed to be for a quick release. So it was nice to get that extra little residual. So that's one way voice actors get paid. Now there are sites online like that one I was referencing earlier who simply buy the audio from the voice talent and never pay them again. They never get any usage. Mm -hmm. It's all in perpetuity. And then, you know, I, I'll give you an example. I did an ad for the Good Feet store, and they paid me for uh, six-month usage. And at the end of six months, they came back to me, and they wanted me to give them the rights in perpetuity. But they didn't want to pay any more. And I was like, I can't do that. I'm sorry. And so they yeah. recasted it. But the reason that I couldn't pay them, I couldn't do it and just give them the rights in perpetuity because this was for national broadcast. They were putting it in all sorts of different markets. Um, the week before, I'd had an ad for Nike that I had an audition for. I couldn't have auditioned for that ad for Nike because they wanted exclusivity. And that's forever. For the rest of my career, I wouldn't be able to audition for any footwear spots for the rest of my career. And I'm going to sell that to them for 600 bucks? No. <laughs> no yeah. way. 600000 Thank you? No. <laughs> but having an agent to protect you seems to be really important. Yes, agents do help protect you. But there's also this aspect of the fact that the only person who can really protect you is your yourself and your own knowledge. So education is the best way to understand how somebody might take advantage of you and how you can prevent that. And so, you know, there are people who use those platforms, that particular one online that do really well, but they never do any broadcast work. They're just doing corporate and and that would be fine. Like there's nothing that's not going to hurt them. And at the end of the day, you know, everybody's got to do what they got to do to get, you know, to get by. Mm -hmm. To get by. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, this is why I love doing this is there's so much I'm learning. I mean, I run ads for a living and I run professional ads like the ones you're talking about with the voiceovers, but this is just a side I've never seen. Yeah. And so for, I know we're halfway through, but just thank you so much. This is so cool just for me yeah. to hear about all this. Yeah. Okay. So continuing down the how to, this is a big one. And I think for all freelancers, this is typically the biggest hurdle. Although now that I'm learning about all the stuff you got to do before with voice acting. I don't know. <laughs> this may not be as big, but how do you market yourself? Like, how do you find clients? And once you've found a client, how do you know if they're a good fit for you? So, um, so many different ways to do that. Um, mm -hmm. It's, I would say that it's one of the main reasons I use pay to play sites because they're doing a ton of advertising. Um, Voices.com is one of the big ones. And uh, if you type in voice actor in a Google search, they are the first thing that's going to pop up, right? So if I'm on there, I might have uh, 30, 40, 50 auditions a day that I have access to that I can audition for, which means I'm putting my voice in front of someone who right now at this exact moment in time is looking to hire a voice actor. Now, I might not be the voice actor that they want for this project because they may be looking for a Hispanic male and I'm a female. And unfortunately, they don't sort it by those things always. Sometimes they'll just put it out to anybody. But if they hear my voice and they're like, ooh, I, you know, I really liked her, they might remember me and come back. And I've actually had that happen um, multiple times. So it gets me in front of a person right then and there. Then we do direct marketing. So I, I'll research, you know, video production companies or marketers or uh, people who do e-learning uh, creative directors and we'll find them and add them on LinkedIn. There's a lot of different methods uh, for marketing that are like there's people who sell like whole courses on how to do this. And I find that they're all doing the same thing, which means that everybody's getting the same messages from voice actors all the time. 
And so it's kind of a struggle to know, like, how do you stand out from the crowd? So I, it's not something that I do a ton of right now. I should be doing probably more of it, but it's that ick factor of like, I was just sliding into somebody's DMs. Hey, you should hire me next time you do a project. So I try to just build connections with people instead, you know, and, and get to know them and, and comment on their stuff and hope that when they need somebody for a project that they'll remember me. And that's happened a lot where they did remember me. Um, sometimes I'm a lot more direct. There have been times when I've sent one method that people use a lot is direct email marketing, right? So you send an email, hey, you, if I've noticed you have voice actors on your website, you know, do you have a roster? Would you be willing to put me on your roster? I've booked some great work that way. Um, but <laughs> this is a 12 hour conversation, right? Like how do you market? <laughs> it's a big one. Um, I personally think following Mark Scott, Everyday Viewpreneur, he is a, he has tons of free information. He has a podcast that is quite literally all about marketing. And there are more than 100 episodes. I don't know, 200 episodes. So you that's a lot of content about marketing. So there's a lot to say. Um, currently, I'm utilizing TikTok. I'm an old lady. I didn't think I would ever find a place on TikTok. But I'm having a blast. And I've actually had multiple people message me with job opportunities and auditions in the last few weeks just from making TikTok videos about what I do. So that's been fun. So really, the sky's the limit. Anything that gets your name out there, um, gets you in front of people. My friend Jen Greenfield, she could talk marketing all day. And one thing she talks a lot about is don't be afraid to talk to strangers, right? So she will talk to the person on the airplane next to her and be like, hey, did you know I'm a voice actor? And they'll be like, oh, what? Well, tell me more about that. And then suddenly she's got a job with somebody's brother's sister's husband who works in corporate and you know what I mean? Like, you just never know. And so um, another thing that I do is I go to networking events locally, and I enjoy that. It Number one, it helps me get outside of this little space. We sit in these little boxes. Like, I'm touching both sides of my room right now, right? It's tiny. And we talk to ourselves, literally, all day. It's nice to be able to yeah. talk to a person, but most of the time it's not a person. We're just talking to ourselves. So networking is great in person. Um, I really missed that during COVID. So it's been nice to kind of get back out again. It's harder for me because I have a house full of children. So leaving at night can be tough. But Th Those in-person events, are they specific to voice acting or are these just in-person events where, for me, I've just noticed if I can get myself to the location and just start talking with people like you said the network that they've already established by connecting with them they're going to know somebody that knows somebody that needs my service are they yes. just more general market yeah they're we guys? have a a local voice actor group that kind of hangs out like maybe once a year or twice a year we'll get together that's not booking me work that's more for right. commiseration, uh, chatting about the industry, talking, but um, networking events with other professionals of mm -hmm. any type is golden because you just, like you said, you never know who who in their network is going to be somebody who's like, oh, we need a voice actor like right now. And we need one who's a professional who has the equipment and who can do um, a Source Connect session, for example. That's that's something we haven't even talked about, but um, it's the ability for a studio remotely to co connect to my studio. So that they're actually recording on their end through my microphone, kind of like what you're doing with Zencaster, right? Like right. they connect and they record on their end and they have an engineer and I just get to perform. That's the best. Those are the best sessions in the world. And I literally just get to be the voice actor and someone else does all the rest of the work. I don't even touch no the audio. Editing, nothing like that. Wow. Yeah. So there, that's an example of where it really is just that skill that you're really, really good at. But Well, it's having the equipment and, and the know-how. Like I, um, Source Connect is a program you have to buy or you have to pay a subscription to one way. You can do it either way. And you have to have a space that is prepared to handle a, a Source Connect session. I, if I tried to do it in a walk-in closet and my dog was barking or the neighbor's dog was barking, it would ruin the session. And mm -hmm. so you would be very unprofessional. Um, so you have to have a space that's ready for that before. You, and you have to be um, you have to have the equipment in the space is what I guess what I'm getting at before you're ready for Source Connect sessions. But, yeah, that's a whole different level. 
And I feel like I got totally off track, but I do that. uh, That's okay. That's okay. But in that scenario, which may be more rare, it really is just you're incredibly good with the skill and already have the setup. But what I found and what we've kind of talked about is most of freelancing, at least the energy and time is learning everything else like you can be incredibly good at this one skill but you got to learn how to market you got to learn how to invoice you got to learn how to edit like the the clips and voice overs and things like that so that is cool though that that scenario does seem to be just more focused on the actual voice acting yeah it's it's the best case scenario for our job Mm -hmm. um it means you have to be able to take direction. That's a, another, you talked about soft skills mm-hmm. that you need. You need to be able to take direction. So it's amazing how many people, you ask them to read a line, like let's say the line is, um, you're just in time for dinner, right? And if if they say, well, can you give it to us again? Try it a different way. And you're like, you're just in time for dinner. And they're like, well, can we, <laughs> let's try it again with a little more energy. You're just in time yeah. for dinner. All three of those sounded oh, the yeah. same. What they're looking for is you're just in time for dinner. You're just in time for dinner. You're just in time for dinner. You know, like the three different aspects. And so when they say, can you give it to us a little bit more chill and low key? Like you've got to be able to quickly be able to deliver that. And that's where coaching comes in. Because when you coach with someone, they direct you and you practice taking that direction and listening to feedback and being able to give them what they want back. That is that is probably the the most important key to success in your performance is being able to listen, give per- direction, and, and uh, give them what they're asking for without whining and complaining about it. But I liked it that way. No, you just keep your mouth shut, do your job. <laughs> I, I'm i still learning how to uh, take criticism, although a lot of the criticism I receive are from people that don't know how to run ads and they just think they know how to run ads. In that scenario, I'm sure they're well-versed. In- no. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no, no. And that's yeah, actually, I think, one of the things that makes it hard is when you've got a, 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 an advertising executive is not a voice actor, right? And mm-hmm. they're listening in on your session and they're like, um, I'll give you an example. My daughter actually is a voice actor as well. She's 12. And she did a session this week uh, for a client and they wanted her. The line was, uh, I don't even remember what the line was, but she had this line and they kept reading it to her and and they'd be like just try it again and they'd be like like this and every single time they said it to her exactly the same way Mm -hmm. and she's looking at me and she's like like what do I do yeah yeah because she's young enough in her career that she's still figuring this out so we had a great conversation afterwards about like just just sometimes you have to give them what they didn't ask for because you have they don't know what they want until you do it you know, like I might say a line five times and they might give me the, this specific direction. And what I end up at the last is something totally different than their direction. But that's what they wanted. But they didn't know it until they heard it. That sounds that sounds weird to try to explain that if you haven't ever been in a session. But you're the actor. You have to come up with it. And sometimes they don't know how to tell you to do that. Right. Mm-hmm. It's always an amazing, wonderful thing when you get to work with a um really good director uh, who knows how to get you to where you need to go. And then when you're working with someone who's not, you've got to be that yourself. You've got to self-direct. So, and of course, a lot of the work that we do, no one is in the room and I'm just giving them like four takes or three takes and then they're going to choose. So I'll do one that's faster and more upbeat and one that's a little bit slower and more casual and maybe one that kind of marries the two in the middle that's in, in case they need to hit a time point, you know? So that's all you when it's like that. All the direction is you. Yep. You've got to be the director absolutely in that position. And I think yeah. that's also applicable to almost all types of freelance work where I found, and this is a lot of my current clients, it's pretty hands off, right? Where they're like, hey, we just need performance. You're the absolute expert. And so to be, independent, motivating, and I guess you want, if you want to call it direct, be able to direct yourself to get that performance is crucial in my experience with freelancing. Yeah. I mean, it really applies to any field. 
Like, let's yeah. say you're a graphic designer and they're like, design me a logo and they don't really know what they want. So you give them exactly. several options to choose from and they've got to pick the one that they like. And then they're going to give you feedback and say, I like this, but can you do it in blue? You know, and I've got one more how to question and then I have a final question. OK, this one, I really like this how or how to or how question, because I think a lot of people with freelancing sometimes get worried that like what if they fail like I'm not even gonna try because it's so risky or what happens if I fail and so I like to ask this question but I guess this is two part one how do you mitigate risk your risk for freelancing and then the final question when you're ready is if you had to restart like let's say you maybe similar to during the pandemic and maybe you weren't as active with communicating with your clients and so you lost a lot of work. If that happened again, but very dramatically, like you had to totally restart, what would you do? Sorry, okay. that's two big questions. <laughs> if I forget the second question, don't be don't be afraid to remind I me. Will. My brain gets okay. distracted. Um, I think that I come from when it, when we're going back to the how do you mitigate the risk. Mm -hmm. I come from a little bit of a place of privilege, um, so it's hard for me to fully answer that question. I. Uh, I was a stay-at-home mom, and we were completely reliant on my husband's income. So when I started working, we never budgeted my income into our budget. So that's how we made we mitigated the risk. There was no risk because any money that I made was excess. So it was, well, we just won't go on that trip this year, you know, or it was all for extra things. Now I'm using it to help support my children in college. So mm -hmm. I do need it a little bit more, but at the same time, it's not like... They couldn't take out a loan if they, you know, like there are ways around the the process. So when I talk to people, I, I talked to a gentleman about, I don't know, six months ago, he was out of a job, such a nice guy. And he called me up and he's like, I'm thinking about trying voice acting. And I said, no, you have a family to support. You have children. Your wife doesn't work. This is not the career field for you right now. It is a job that is a slow build. Nobody's going to start doing voice acting and make a living wage within a year, maybe three. It is a it is a slow build no matter who you are. So most voice actors, and I think this is true for freelancers in general in a lot of ways, they'll do, they have their day job, right? And then they do their passion project, their freelance thing on the side slowly until they can eventually transition to more and more doing the freelance. Um, so I came from a place of privilege where I had more time to juggle and the ability to be all in right from the beginning time wise because I didn't have to I didn't have another job I had to juggle now not mm -hmm. technically not when I was getting paid for but I'm always and juggling like my primary mom. career yeah I do yes. consider my yes. primary career to be wife and mom to five kids and that is mm -hmm. a busy job for anybody mm -hmm. so um but yeah it's the other thing that I'd like to talk about a lot is you said, how do you deal with that risk and that fear of failure separate from the income? Because I, I've been very blunt about that. This is not a money-making career from the beginning. It takes time. Right. I it Year three was when I made what we considered a living wage. Like I could support a small family on that income. Um, and I invested a good portion of that year's income back into my business. It's how I have the Studio Bricks booth and the nice microphone and the better equipment is that I started with a Rode NT1 I, in my walk-in closet. Then we built mm -hmm. me a small studio. Then we moved me into the, you know, like we, we'd we slowly, gradually transitioned a little bit at a time to better equipment, better training, better resources, better demos. I've had two commercial demos because the first one was, eh, you know, I wasn't quite ready for it. Um, the second one was amazing. And now I'm already like, eh, it's two years old. It's probably time to do a new one just because my skills have changed. You know, like mm -hmm. that's a transition period. But with the this particular job, you take a lot of no's. And it because you're putting yourself out there artistically, those no's can feel very crushing. They can feel mm -hmm. very um, personal. Like, oh, they didn't like my voice. They don't like me. And imposter syndrome can really become a problem for voice actors. So what I want people to always keep in their mind is that it's like you're at an ice cream shop and you are a flavor of ice cream. And that day they may just want cherry vanilla and your butter pecan. 
you know, and it does not make your butter pecan any less amazing. But they just needed cherry vanilla and someone else is going to need butter pecan down the road. So you keep being the best butter pecan that you can, you know, and you don't worry about why am I not cherry vanilla? You're never going to be cherry vanilla. No matter how hard you try, you're just not. So you just have to let go of the rejection not let it, not take it personal. I don't even go look anymore about whether somebody has shortlisted, which is like 200 people audition and they'll choose 10, right? Like I used to mm-hmm. check my shortlist rate and my statistics and whether they liked me or not. I don't, I don't even look anymore. If they call me to book the job, great. Otherwise I don't, I don't need to know. I'm just moving on, set it and forget it, you know? Um, mm-hmm. So I hope that answers your question. There is a big totally. risk of failure. Um, you need a safety net, it's not a job for somebody who wants to support a family, not at the outset. Can someone support a family on this income? Yes, but not at the beginning. If you had to restart, what would you do? Though this is interesting based off what you said, where the ramp up period was rather large, but it seems like even if you were to lose all your clients currently and couldn't find work for a little bit, that snowball effect with what we just talked about there's still a snowball always there. You have all these connections and all these people that you know, right? Well, I mean, I think that actually that's where I am. So it's, I think it's a really mm-hmm. great question for me specifically right now because I, I had major surgery in August and I had um, a zero dollar month. <laughs> I've ne- and since I started working, I had never had a zero dollar month. Like that had never happened. Mm-hmm. So I had a month where I literally made no income, and then the next mm-hmm. month I made no income. And it's, I had some serious complications of that surgery that have caused some life changes for me that have been difficult. And then my kids had some problems that we had to work through. And so I have not put as much effort into my snowball. I prioritized my age in auditions, but that was mm-hmm. pretty much status quo on everything else. So I haven't been investing in that snowball as much. And January is my, where, I, where I'm planning to kind of just jump back in and really really dial back into the business aspect and marketing and all the things. Um, But I'm not coming into that without a knowledge of how to edit audio, a knowledge of how to produce, Mm -hmm. a knowledge of how to perform and what's marketable in the industry right now. So I'm, again, coming from a place of privilege where, yes, I'm restarting in many ways. Many of the clients that I've worked with for years have gone in another direction or they, this is the thing about the creative industry nobody really talks about, but People switch careers a lot in the creative industry. Have you noticed that? Like marketing directors, creative directors, like they're they're switching jobs like every two years. So when they leave, they they want new voices. And that's something people don't talk about. So like I did all of the ads for a bunch of ads for Learning Resources, which is a children's toy company for like two years. And then um, they hired a new marketing team. And the new marketing team was like, we want a younger voice. And so old me was out, right? Like, and we lose jobs like that a lot. If new marketing team comes in, same thing, uh, Pella Windows. I did all of their stuff for a while. And then new marketing team, every somebody leaves, they don't take you with them. <laughs> so. Yeah. That's um, That's actually my last guest. She brought that up as well. But it was more of a severed disconnect where she was a content writer as a freelancer. Oh. And so she had essentially in this scenario, one point of contact and that person quit. And then she, she was like, I have no idea how to connect with these, this company again. And so she, and it was, I think it was big enough where it was like, yeah, you could reach out and get some, somebody on the phone, but to then reestablish that connection is really hard. It is really hard. And you, and it happens all the time. So a year ago I had a major client and I had done work for them that was in queue. So I had already done the audio, but they hadn't put it to video yet. And um, the guy completely ghosted me in January. So I did it all in like August, September, October, November. I was doing all this work for them. He just stopped responding. And so I tried to, you know, hunt him down, figure out what happened. I'd sent him several messages. And finally, I did a Google search on him one day and I found out he had passed away. So he was not there anymore. And so then I started, I tried to email the person who had been under him at that point in time, never responded to my email. So I'm like, I just, it was thousands of dollars worth of work that I had done Mm -hmm. that 
A, I never got paid for it, and they never used. I mean, I looked just to make sure they weren't using it, but um, and I don't know how to, without being awkward, reach back out to that company. So I noticed that this guy had an unexpected change in life yes. <laughs> status you know like how do you yes, it, and life. and I my, and my heart hurts for him he was such a nice guy we were friends you know but nobody's gonna go tell the voice actor that the video producer they were working with passed away in his sleep over the weekend you know what I mean right. so it's not it's not always a career change sometimes it's something like that but I mean that's obviously a extreme scenario but the point is you just never know where your work is going to go and so you have to be constantly building your snowball and continuing connecting with other people and reaching back out to past clients. That's something I've kind of dropped the ball on the last few months again, like during the during COVID is um, reaching back out to clients is a great way for them to be like, oh, yeah, we loved working with you. It's not like people are thinking about the voice actor they used on that project in July in August or September. They're not. They're they're right. They're work. They're working yeah, on other I things. Mean, constantly present and that's all freelancing yeah absolutely whether that's new new prospects or past clients or even current clients having even a backup communication line is crucial in cases you yep. and I have now seen yeah well, and there's a balance of when it's awkward and you're just is this person just messaging me to get work or do they care about me you know like you have to you have to find a balance so Alicia, thank you so much for joining us. What's the best way a listener can get a hold of you? This has been really great. Thank you. Oh, I thank you. Ha have a website. Um, it is Alicia Bake Voiceovers. And my name is spelled so weird, so I'm just going to say it in case somebody's not looking at your podcast. But it's A-L-E-E-S-H-A-B-A-K-E, -E -E, voiceovers.com. Um, so it's just aliciabakevoiceovers.com or I'm on LinkedIn. I'm active on TikTok. Um, mm -hmm. you're, you can always find me at VO Booth Besties as well. Uh, again, www.voboothbesties.com. And that's, your um, podcast? that's my podcast. Yep. Okay. Yep. And there's tons. If anybody's interested in voice acting, all the info is real. I mean, we all the info is there. Well, and as we've explored over this, you know, past hour there's a lot of information that cannot be compressed into a, an hour worth of talking no um, so and go, i try to shove it all in out. and talk faster and sorry yeah <laughs> no it was fantastic i learned so much again I, you know as a freelancer a lot of times you're in your lane if you want to call it that but you you interact with content like what you do and so it was really cool to see behind the curtains of what you're experiencing and i hope it's help some individuals realize that this is a valid career, that maybe the runway is longer than uh, other freelance positions, but that you can eventually make it and make it good. And kind of going back, you know, the snowball, you, you may be resetting a lot in your current situation, but you've built up these amazing skills. You've built up tons and tons of connections. You have a, the literally the equipment, the studio, You've already built that all up. So hopefully, a, you know, a, a listener can see that freelancing, although it can be a little risky compared to a salary job, that by connecting, by diversifying your income, by working with other clients and companies, you can actually be rather safe, at least in my experience. And I, I think come January, you're going to bounce right back just knowing your connections and skills so yeah that's that's the plan <laughs> well thank you so much alicia that was seriously such a pleasure this was freelancing 101 episode three with alicia blake alicia bake please subscribe and hit the notification bell if you have any questions or comments reach out to me on linkedin i'm happy to answer any any of them thank you so much